This is Chester Elton. Today on the Anxiety at Work podcast, we're tackling uncertainty and how we can turn something scary into a force for good. Joining me is my writing partner and my dear friend, Adrian Gostick. Well, thanks, Jess. You know, in this episode, we've invited two fascinating guests to help us turn uncertainty in our lives into opportunities for personal growth, innovation, and creativity. Nathan Furr is a professor of strategy and innovation at the INSEAD in Paris and an expert in the fields of innovation and technology strategy. His best-selling books include The Innovator's Method and Innovation Capital. Published regularly in Harvard Business Review, MIT Sloan Management Review, Forbes and Inc., he has been nominated for the Thinkers 50 Innovation Award and works with companies including Google, Microsoft, Citi, and Philips. Susanna Harmon Furr is an entrepreneur, a designer, art historian, and my favorite title, a contrarian. (laughs) Her clothing line is inspired by her research into the intricate embroidery Dutch women painstakingly rendered on their plain uniforms. Details often invisible to all but the wearer and its significance in their daily lives. She has also founded a design services firm. So Nathan and Susanna are also the parents of four teenagers that's probably what's keeping them most busy right now and why they know so much about uncertainty absolutely yeah exactly in their new book the upside of uncertainty it comes out in july 19th from harvard business review press we are delighted to have them both here on our humble podcast delighted to meet you here virtually nathan and Susanna. thanks for great to be here what a great introduction Hey, we are thrilled to have you both. Uh, Susanna is joining us from Tuscany. Nathan, I assume you're in Paris today. And we're going to we're going to start with you, Nathan. Um, We wrote about uncertainty in our book, Anxiety Works. We think this is a fascinating topic. We wanted to go deeper. And you say uncertainty hits us in many aspects of our professional lives. You know, we could be looking for the courage to start a new project, start a new career, even, you know, develop an idea or reinvent ourselves after a, a change in our life, maybe even a disappointment. So walk us what through uncertainty, walk us through what uncertainty does to our bodies and our minds and maybe what we're missing by not paying attention to uncertainty. <clears throat> so it's interesting. What really motivated this question for me is that for the last 20 plus years, I've gotten to interview innovators, uh, some really big names too. And one thing I noticed in interviewing them is that to do anything new, to do the things we we love, we talk about, that we tell stories about, they had to first go through a lot of uncertainty. They had to step into the unknown. And as somebody who struggles with that, um, Susanna's naturally better than I am, uh, I was wondering how do they do it and how do we get better? Now, why does this matter? Uh, Because what it turns out is that uh, our brains are wired to be afraid of uncertainty. So if you look at not neuroscientific studies, it's very clear we have our brains heat up and, and it creates an anxiety response. Why is that a problem though? Well, because while we all talk about wanting change and transformation and new and good things, that only comes after going through uncertainty. So this recognition that uncertainty and possibility are really two sides of the same coin. Now, some of you may be saying, oh, but, you know, that's okay. I just want things steady and easy. The other problem for anybody who's saying, well, I didn't really want change or transformation is that regardless of what you want, uncertainty is definitely increasing in the world around us. It's very clear. The evidence is clear. And it means that uncertainty is going to happen to you whether you want to or not. So I really feel like there's this imperative to ask, what are the tools to face uncertainty, both so that we can capture new possibilities in our lives, but also so that we can better deal with the inevitable changes that will affect us over the course of, of you know, hopefully long careers and, and personal lives. You know, that's so interesting, isn't it? It's going to happen no matter what. So prepare for it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Susanna, I want to bring you into the conversation here. You know, What Nathan described can be scary and make anybody uncomfortable. But you say the best entrepreneurs are really good at navigating uncertainty. So walk us through what you found in your research. 
So one thing I love about entrepreneurs and, and I have been able to benefit from myself is when you've done something new and you've gotten to that other side of the scary bit, you realize, oh, wait, I had to go through that. And so um, most of entrepreneurs really actually tend to like uncertainty. They've figured it out. Now, I will say a hilarious tidbit is that they've they always claim they love it so much, but when you look underneath it, they have what we term as uncertainty balancers. So they have found ways in their lives to, to kind of hedge up the comfort level because they know they're gonna be trafficking in so much uncertainty, whether it's a new product launch, launch or whatever. So some examples of this would be um, Sam Yagen. He's, he's a multi-startup guy. He's done tons of cool stuff like disrupt his company when so he was at match.com when they rolled out tinder so he's had a lot of uncertainty he's led tons of teams but he basically shared with us like oh yeah in my personal life i love it things to be chill and comfortable so his best friends were from high school his sweetheart or his wife was his high school sweetheart he has a lot of comfort in just kind of having these people around him he can count on so yes entrepreneurs love uncertainty but they let themselves have these comforts some entrepreneurs stay in the same hotel room every single time they travel they sit in the same flight seat it could look like your wardrobe that you kind of streamlined what you wear so you don't have to stress about what am i going to do today with my my wardrobe so you know uh steve jobs is the famous one and 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 it was just it made it easier to just get up every day and get out there and do stuff so yes entrepreneurs are good at it but they help themselves by creating these routines and rituals to to be able to deal in the uncertainty and the other things that feel more important to them. And, and we're looking right now at Chester wearing the same orange shirt every day. It's actually not the same. He's got like 20 of these things. Yeah. Oh, cool. I love <laughs> 20 orange. of the same shirt. Yes. Really? <laughs> it's a happy color. Who doesn't? Oh my gosh, you know, I find I love Susanna, it. everybody loves, everybody loves orange except for Adrian. You're using it as an uncertainty balancer right there. So that's great. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Why worry about what you're going to wear? Well, my, my wardrobe is pretty bland and boring too. I know there's, there's, you know, four shirts that can uh, be rotated. So, um, so to deal with this now, what you've learned from, and I'll turn it back to Nathan now, what you learned from these entrepreneurs developed into a model. And so walk us through this from reframe to prime to do. I, I think that this is really fascinating. If you take us through these steps and how we apply them in our work or personal lives. So uh, we really we really drew on three sources of research here. We looked at the existing uh, empirical research from fields like psychology, innovation, entrepreneurship, strategy. We conducted a bunch of interviews, and then we filled in gaps where you know interviews pointed us, but they maybe weren't giving us the the tool. And what we came up with was over thirty tools, practical things that we can do to face cur uh, uncertainty with greater courage and. That's a lot of tools, right? How do you even keep sense of that? So we organized these tools around this metaphor of a first aid cross for uncertainty, this kind of forearms of the first aid cross, the help that's available to help you face uncertainty. And maybe it's just that you're feeling so much uncertainty in your daily life. You're like, I don't want more uncertainty. Just help me bring down the temperature. Well, it can help you do that. Or maybe you're saying, I want to do something new, but how do I get the courage to do that? So it helps with both. And the four arms of the first aid cross are, or the four categories of things to remember are number one, reframing. Reframing uncertainty from a source of loss, which ignites that anxiety response in our brain, like, oh no, uh, you know, uncertainty is dangerous, to reframing it to a source of opportunity. Recognizing, as I said earlier, that Uncertainty and possibility are two sides of the same coin. So while we may see uncertainty, inevitably there's possibility on the other side of that. So there's some deep psychological research uh, in this that backs us up, but it's that reframing is the first step to facing uncertainty well. Then second, uh, we can prime. Think about how you prime like a pump, so it pumps water. Or you prime a wall so the paint sticks. There are actions you can take, things you can do, to be prepared so that when uncertainty happens to you, it causes you less uncertainty. So Susanna was talking about one of those tools in the prime category of uncertainty balancers. The third thing is that we've learned from the research on innovation and strategy that you can. there are ways to do. There are ways to take action that help you resolve uncertainty to, in, in a way that has a greater probability of, of an outcome you might want. And then fourth, uh, 
inevitably uncertainty brings challenging emotions. So you need to sustain yourself through that. You need to, you're going to have setbacks. You're going to have maybe failures in quotes. Um, and how do you, you know, endure the emotions that come with that and turn it to better purposes? So again, uh, reframing from loss to a source of gain, priming so that you're ready for the uncertainty, doing in ways that lead to better outcomes, and fourth, sustaining yourself and your emotions through that, or the emotions of your organization through that uncertainty. That's really interesting. It's always nice to have that framework, like you say, to, to kind of make those, you know, go down that checklist and see where you are. You know, um, Susanna, as an entrepreneur, uh, how have you used the methods that you talk about in your book, in, in your work as an entrepreneur? You know, um, some of the tools that Nathan uh, hasn't mentioned yet, well, I guess we he's mentioned the categories. So each category has immense amounts of tools. And I think maybe my favorite has been to work on projects that really are aligned with my values. And um, actually one of the entrepreneurs we researched and spent time with was uh, David Heinemeyer Hansen, who has done tons of cool startups, um, Ruby on Rails and Basecamp to name a couple. But he basically figured out that if you, if you work from your values, you can't fail because no matter what happens, no matter if the uh, audience or public loves what you do or not, you have been able to stay true to that. So his example is he writes great software, he treats his employees well, and he's he works ethically in the marketplace. So I'm giving you ideas of what other people have done. For me, that has been kind of my guiding light too. Um, just like my, my research with the Dutch, I was doing my art history masters and when I discovered these women that were embroidering their clothes and then I went from there to start my clothing line, um, because I was so inspired. And so it was something like really tangible for me. Oh my gosh, our clothes can be meaningful and we can curate these wardrobes that, that we care about that maybe aren't so trend driven and that are, that are based on our values. And so we had teeny kids, Nathan was doing his PhD. And ultimately after a couple years of doing that, I, my values led me to say, you know what, I'm going to put this on hold and I'm going to really focus on raising my kids for a little bit of time. And from there, I kind of followed my, my, um, my, again, my value of loving design, but working in a way that didn't feel like I was just throwing myself all in and, and kind of wreaking havoc on my personal life. So I think that for me, I would say values driven work, getting involved with projects that you really believe in, because it's going to take a ton of time. You are going to feel anxious. You're going to be worried about it. But when you're doing things you really care about and love, um, the energy's there. It's coming from the right place. So that might be my easiest answer for that. I love that. And I, I love that everybody listening who's got a kid who's in art history can now say, my kid can actually make a career and do something cool. So, <laughs> you know, I love what you're, you've done with your, uh, with your education and mixing it with, you know, with real world applications. So, hey, how do people learn more about your work, Nathan and Susanna? Well, um, one of the best resources is a website we've created called uncertaintypossibility.com. How can you remember that? This basic idea that uncertainty and possibility are two sides of the coin. And we really, our goal has been to make this available to everyone. So all the tools are talked about there. But of course, you know, we are also would love if people bought the book on Amazon or on an independent bookseller and left a review. We'd be really grateful for that because this is really a, a values driven piece of work. We're really writing this to friends, to our friends to say, how do you have the courage to do the things that help you create a life you love and, and enjoy? I love that. And uh, Nathan, while, while you've, I've got you, uh, you told the story on your website. I found this and it was really great as I was watching through, there's a, some wonderful videos and other things on your website that I encourage people to check out. You told the story of, of all these four seasons and Mac Rick, Max Richter's take on reframing this. So walk us what through we should learn from Max and, and uh, how, how this could help me as a business person. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, I really love that example. I'm glad you picked up on it because um, there was a philosopher, a, a, a contemporary philosopher who said something really f fabulous. His name was John O'Donohue and he said, facts are just possibilities that came into being. And for every uh, fact, there are thousands of unrealized possibilities. And it kind of makes you re-see like, what we see as reality. And what I love about that is if you think about something like Vivaldi's Four Seasons, 
By the way, Vivaldi himself was a fascinating character. He uh, was a priest who worked at a charity hospital in Venice that took in uh, orphans, and he would write music for the orphans that uh, nobody would take in. And typically these were uh, usually uh, children who had some sort of... Um, maladaptation so maybe they had you know a, a, a physical disability of some kind and he basically created uh, and trained them to be he created this beautiful music and then trained them to be some of the greatest musicians in Europe and people would express just profound amazement at what they performed and achieved but they would perform behind a curtain and so they would beg to see behind the curtain and when they pulled down the curtain they expected to see these you know angels, uh, uh, these beautiful creatures that produce this glorious music. And in fact, they were often really like, um, had really serious challenges. And, and people were amazed, like you took these seemingly uh, broken vessels and made some of the greatest beauty available. So first off, I love the spirit of Vivaldi. But let's face it, we've all heard of Vivaldi's Four Seasons a million times. We've heard it in the elevator. It's so tired and old. You know, and, and but what I love about Max Richter is he takes something that we take so for granted, so standardized, and then he said, well, what's the spirit of this thing, and how could I play with it? And he said, you know, those opening lines, those opening few chords of music are really amazing. What if I, like, looped it on itself and made it like a dance track? And I mean, it's not dance music, but how could I play with this thing that we all take for granted and make something new out of it? Now, what does that have to do with you? What does it have to do with your life? I think the most powerful things in our individual lives and in organizations are those assumptions we ha all take so for granted we never look at it. And what I love about the Richter and the Vivaldi example is it can be really powerful and inspiring to take that assumption and play with it. And in small or big ways, I'll, I'll just share very briefly one of a silly moment of playing with that assumption is uh, I was living in Canada in it was uh, in the winter and so it got dark really early and I was sharing the apartment with some other uh, young guys and we the bedroom was miserable it was this little tiny porthole of a window and we were getting really depressed and it was cold and meanwhile we had this living room with these big windows looking over the city and it was sitting empty all day and finally one day I said who says that you have to sleep in the bedroom? We never have guests. Let's move our beds into the living room. And we woke up to the sunrise every morning. And that's something super simple and basic. But our lives are full of these assumptions that we can, we take as facts, but are really just one of thousands of possibilities we could reinvent if we wanted to. That is so brilliant. You know, I, I love that reframing. And uh, by the way, I, I loved your, your, your call out to write a review of the book. Now, don't just ask people to write a review, Nathan. Say, look, I want a five-star review. And if you can't write a five-star review, keep it to yourself. Because <laughs> the, the one-star reviews are not helpful at all. Um, uh. Hey, Susanna, I want to bring you in, into the conversation because, you, you know, as you have looked up uh, me and Adrian, we're big proponents of gratitude. Is there a link uh, to gratitude and uncertainty in, in the work and the studies that you've done? Gratitude is a huge aspect of uncertainty possibility. Uh, basically, and one of my favorite places to go to learn more about it is the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley, and they have a beautiful website to make people really feel even more motivated than maybe what we've written. But in the sustain group of tools, uh, gratitude is such a huge portal when we are feeling sorry for ourselves or down and out. Um, it's one of the frustration management frames actually to say, hey, wait a second, what do I still have? What can I still be grateful for? Um, what am I not remembering in this moment because I'm so discouraged? So counting your blessings, remembering what is still going well for you. Even it can be the simple things, the, the yummy coffee in the morning. Um, Nathan tells a beautiful story about during the pandemic when he was feeling really urgent and stressed about a lot of his work canceling. And he could share that with you better than I will. So he could share that story. But gratitude comes into play um, even in the reframe section because sometimes when we are considering something or not, when we come at our options from a more great, grateful place and an optimistic place, we see more possibility we actually can feel into a wider expansive world. So I think it's a really critical step to have at 
at all times for any uncertainty journey you're facing. That's so great. So, Nathan, do you want to tell us the story of your yummy yeah. coffee in the morning? Uh, yeah, it's a good story because, um, you know, we started this project long, long before the pandemic. You know, at least 10 years I've been interviewing folks. And um, but the pandemic comes along and so much of my income comes from keynotes and things like that. And those were canceled in four days. And then even the university was like, mm, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we'll fold. And so I was really freaking out. And Susanna just turned to me and said, hey, if you can't use these tools to help yourself, you don't get to write this book. I won't let you write it. <laughs> It was great. It was, a, uh, again, contrarian at work. And, uh, but she was right. And one of those tools is about gratitude. And um, so I woke, I was, stay, I was staying awake late at night. I was waking up early in the morning because I was so stressed out. You know, we have kids in college. We ha had just made the leap from renting to buying. And so how am I going to make the payments? So, you know, very stresses that a lot of us have. And uh, I woke up early and I went downstairs and I remember, remembered this tool. And I was in the middle of something and suddenly I realized, oh, I'm in the middle of grinding coffee beans. And I just took a minute to smell this rich, earthy smell. And then I suddenly realized, oh my gosh, the sun is coming in the kitchen. I hadn't seen it before, but here it was streaming in slantwise across the kitchen. And it was so beautiful. And it, all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, even if I lost it all, I would have this sunlight in the morning. I would have these coffee beans and I would have relationships with the people I love. Oh my gosh, you know what? I could lose it all. I could lose the job. We, I could go bankrupt. I could not be able to pay tuitions and I would still have so much. And you know, the stress really fell away from my shoulders in that instant. And uh, it was, you know, that moment of, you know, paying attention to what do I still have, not what might I lose. I love that, Nathan. And, and it leads me to my, my last question is, other than grounding your co grinding your coffee beans in the morning, walk us through your daily practices to keep your emotional fitness high when we do, as you say, face so much uncertainty. The last two and a half years have been nothing but. So, Nathan, we'll start with you, and then we'll go to Susanna. How do you maintain your daily practices? Yeah. So, um, number one, uh, this idea of uncertainty balancers that Susanna talked about, creating some sources or some home bases of certainty is really important. But, you know, the one I like that Susanna does a good job of reminding me about, um, I, I, I guess, you know, the values over goals is a big one. But the one that I always love is a tool we call the infinite game. It actually wasn't our idea. It came from a philosopher at NYU. His name was James Kars. And what he argued is that in life, there's really kind of two kinds of players. There are people, he called them finite players, who see the goal of life is winning. They see the rules and the roles and the boundaries is fixed. And for them, uncertainty is a very stressful thing because it introduces the well, wait a minute, this wasn't a variable I calculated. I might not be able to win. I might not be able to get this, you know, top position in what I'm doing or the top this or that. Uh, but by contrast, he said there are a second set of players in the world who see life and the game as, as an infinite game. The goal isn't to win. The goal is to enjoy playing the game and continue playing. And they play with the boundaries. They play with the rules. They play with the roles. They play with the purpose of the game. For them, uncertainty just means, oh, cool, new variables got uh, put into play. And so I, I love asking myself this question, what's the infinite game? And, you know, Susanna helps remind me of that. So when I step into a hard situation, you know, let's say I'm in another geography with a group of skeptical executives and they're saying, yeah, we don't know if what you have to say is relevant to us because we've got this and that and supply chain, this and that. I, I kind of say, what's the infinite game I can play here? What's the role, you know, that I can play with? And I just continue to ask myself that and try to reinvent the game I'm playing. And, you know, I'm, I'm not alone. You know, Yvon Chouinard, who founded Patagonia, he said, listen, I learned early in life that you, if, you, if you can invent your own game, you can always win. If you try to play the game others are playing, it makes it really hard. I love that. Invent your own game, you can always win. Yeah, my brother used to do that to me when we were playing. My older brother, he would change the rules in the middle of the game. I never won. So he clearly was a proponent of this uh, philosophy. Hey, this has been... Susanna, really what's, what, are your, uh, what, are your, uh, what are your routines for uh, daily practices? 
You know, I, I really love to just think about every morning, just how to reframe my day. So if it's a really exciting day, I even want to push it to be even cooler or maybe what am I not thinking about? And if it's a day that I'm kind of dreading because there's hard things going on, I think, okay, what might still be coming on the other side of this that I can't see yet? So for me, reframing is always going to be the hugest. And I really do look to poetry and kind of wise people uh, to, to read from them to every morning to just get kind of centered and be thinking about, okay, let's go, let's do this. So reframing is my favorite uh, toolkit. You know, isn't that an interesting practice to read something from someone wise? I, I really appreciate that. You know, I'm, I'm a great collector of quotes. And it's amazing to me how you'll read a quote from, you know, Winston Churchill or Mother Teresa or Adrian Gostick and how it will just inspire you, you know, to, to reframe your day. They, hey, they uh, wish really. they were at my level. <laughs> <laughs> One of these things is not like the other, uh-huh. and it's Winston Churchill. That's right. Yeah, right. Um, so um, really an engaging uh, conversation with you both today. I'd like to ask Susanna first and, and then uh, Nathan, if there's one thing you want people to take away from the conversation, uh, what would that be? Susanna, why don't you kick us off then, Nathan, the big finish. Great. Well, I love the topic of your podcast, actually. I think it's so important because I feel like you are normalizing anxiety as part of life and and making it feel like a safe thing to admit and, and, and encouraging people that that doesn't mean, oh, you're not cut out for this. Uh, one of my favorite things that we didn't interview this person, but our daughter did because Zadie Smith was a visiting author at our kids' school and it was digitally, so it was during the pandemic, but our daughter got to ask her a question because she knew that we were doing this uncertainty research and she said, you know, to hear this amazing author, what do you do? Do you have a practice for uncertainty? And you know what she said? She said, you know, that's the question is being comfortable with uncertainty. And she went on to say that in life, so many people want to disguise or not admit that they ever feel anxious. And she said, you know what, the corner, the tiny corner of my writing is actually about being okay with admitting, I don't know what's happening. I don't feel completely at home here, you know? And it's such a beautiful thing. I've actually read some of her novels and I love it. She, she's such a human writer and she creates these characters that you just love even when they make dumb mistakes. So I would say, One thing I would really encourage the audience is to embrace being human. That's one of the steps in the sustain um, arm of the first aid cross for uncertainty is, hey, we are human. It's a reality check to realize we're going to feel anxious. Even when we've done great before, it's going to happen. And we need to admit that to each other. We need to be okay with it. That's so great. Nathan? Yeah, so I think the one thing I would want people to take away is one simple idea, and that is rather than seeing uncertainty and fearing it or feeling miserable or, ah, I can't believe this is happening, ask one question. How could I let this uncertainty make me stronger? And it's this idea we talk about in the book called transilience. It's what I would call beyond resilience. Resilience is kind of being able to punch and stay standing. Transilience is a word that comes from my field of technology strategy, which means leaping from one state to another. And you've all experienced this. You've all had the moment where something was going really poorly. You were freaking out or you were worried. And then suddenly you had this perspective shift. And it was like literally like, The light comes through the clouds and you're suddenly capable of doing it because you saw it in a new way. And I think one of the most powerful gateways to that kind of transilience is when uncertainty happens to you, when it's whether it's unplanned or whether you knew I'm taking a risk here. Say, how do I how do I use this uncertainty to make me stronger? How do I find the possibility that's hidden even in this unwelcome uncertainty, this unforeseen circumstance, this setback, whatever it may be? That's my hope for myself. That's so great. Uh, thank you both for those, those wrap-ups. You know, especially that part about uh, dealing with anxiety and, and reframing. Transilience. That's a, that's a great well, the, new word we can yeah. add to our lexicon there, Adrian. Yeah. 
Yeah, I actually uh, was kind of re- reticent to start a new page of notes because I have so much for both of you. <laughs> and then I thought, well, I'll try. And then, yeah, you gave me just such a great nugget there for the last page, Nathan. So so thank you both, Susanna and Nathan, for joining us today and for bringing your work into the world. Uh, you're helping a lot of people, and we appreciate it. Adrian, I really, 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 I mean, I know I say this for every podcast. Oh, you say this every time. I, I know, I do. I, I love everybody. I really found this fascinating, how, you know, yeah. reframing and, and all that. I'm just curious, what were some of your takeaways? Because like you, I've got more notes than we can get to. Yeah. Well, again, I like, let's start with where we started with the brain is wired to protect us from uncertainty. We don't want uncertainty. So, you know, I love what Susanna was saying is that entrepreneurs claim they love uncertainty, but, you know, do you really? No, you actually have to train your brain to, to really process and deal with this and to, to reframe it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really appreciate it when he said, look, nobody likes uncertainty. Trust me, it's going to happen. No matter whether you like it or you don't, it's going to happen. So you might as well figure it out. And then, you know, the idea of those four steps of reframing and priming and doing and sustaining. I think it's always helpful when you have that roadmap or a checklist to go through and say, hey, what am I doing to manage this kind of uncertainty to make me better? Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I, you know, some very simple kind of thoughts is, you know, the starting with this idea of reframing, you know, from loss to what do you mean this is happening, you know, to, okay, what's what am I supposed to learn here? What's the opportunity? Um, You know, just Nathan's simple example of, um, you know, I get to smell the coffee beans today. I get to see sunshine streaming through the window. Um, it's a it's a reframe. And, you know, we did that when when the COVID hit, you know, for a few days, we we're like, well, what do we do? Because we're in the same boat. Everything canceled. And we just you and I decided, well, let's go to every client we have and just offer them a, a free Zoom. And we did. And we just did, did, did lots of these. And and it was amazing how that casting that bread upon the waters came back to us, didn't it? Where people said, thank you for helping us in those early days. Um, and we just wanted to reach out and help and 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 reframe, you know, kind of a bad into a good. Yeah. Which which dovetails beautifully into what Susanna said about, you know, uh, Build from your passions, build from your values. And wasn't it interesting, her study of the the Dutch women that would do almost this invisible embroidery? You know, not visible to really anything, anyone else. They knew it was there, though. And that was that Mm -hmm. little, you know, Easter egg or that little invisible encouragement, that craftsmanship. I just just really enjoyed both of their takes on, you know, deal from an area of strength. How is this going to challenge me how's this going to make me better i loved her contrarian view when nathan said hey what are we going to do how are we going to make the payments and she says well if you can't figure this out you don't get to write the book and i I love that good for her yeah because it comes back to what he was saying too about playing by the rules well change the rules you know that's that's how you deal with uncertainty and uh you know in the words of byron elton i'm going to invent my own game (laughs) And that way I can always win, right? I'm, I'm assuming it was Byron that, that was doing that to you. You, yeah. you know you, you know my brothers well. It was absolutely Byron. He, he, would, he would organize like ping pong tournaments and there would be a trophy and he'd already have his name engraved on the trophy before we even started. There was no doubt he was going to win. Um, you know, lastly uh, for me was transilience. What an interesting word, you know. Um, that perspective shift. That seeing things in a new way. And how he said, you know, we've all had this situation where we've been in something we thought, this is horrible, nothing good can come of this. And then there's that moment of transilience where it shifts and we go, hey, maybe, yeah. hey, we can make this work. And, and, and we ask ourselves, how do I use this to make me stronger? Which, you know, like nobody likes getting out of our ruts. Nobody. And yet, that's a great question. I, and I've circled that one. How do I m- use this to make me stronger? So, uh, hopefully, everybody enjoyed this uh, this you know, 30 minutes or so as much as we did. We want to give a big thanks to, to Nathan and Susanna for being on, to, to our producer, Brent Klein, to Christy Lawrence, who helps us find amazing guests. And, of course, to all of you who listen in, especially if you download, that helps build up this uh, Uh, this following of anxiety at work you bet and by the way pick up their book the upside of uncertainty it comes out july 19th available at fine bookstores everywhere and as nathan said if you enjoy the book you know please write a review 
and pass it on. We really are grateful for all the many people that uh, make this podcast possible. And, you know, we can invite you to share it with your friends, upload it, leave a review. We're so grateful for Brent Klein, our wonderful producer, and for Christy Lawrence, who finds these amazing guests for us. We hope that there are a couple of things that you uh, took away from the podcast that can lower your anxiety, make your life a little more enjoyable and a little more fruitful. Adrian, what would you add to that? Uh, Well, we love speaking to audiences around the world virtually or in person, which is yeah, what we picked up from uh, the last two years is that we can do a lot virtually, the two of us. Uh, We love speaking on the topics of wellness, resilience, anxiety at work. So give us a call. We'd love to talk to you about your event. And so until next time, we wish you the best of mental health. Thanks so much for your time. Be well. Mm -hmm.